G'day hobbyists and welcome back to the Hobby Podcast, where we explore all things related to hobbies and passions from trading cards to pop culture and everything else in between. I'm Dean Allsop, your host, and I'm joined by my co-host, The Colonel. What's happening, Dino? What's cooking, good looking? Mate, fresh off ProQuest, got a win. I told you I was going to do it. Did you get an official win? I got an official win. In the ProQuest or was it in the draft segment after that? Don't it, lie to us. It was in the draft section after that. So you that. didn't get an actual ProQuest win? Well, yes. I got there a, we a, go. No, I got a win on the day and I also got a buy win. So <laughs> online, two wins, Dino. <laughs> That's outrageous. I'm ranked 438 in Australia That's at the moment. That's not bad. We, That's not bad. We're getting there. That's not bad, man. Uh, how did you recover from the chili? Talk us through it. Ah, that was so brutal. It yeah. was it was one of those things where for the first I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, it was mm. brutal and then it went away. Yep. The milk was a huge saver. <laughs> um, well, next time, no milk. But I actually want to shout out one of our listeners who sent us a video, Mr. Zach Roberts. <laughs> oh, yeah. He sent us a video eating. He went down to the local supermarket, bought a habanero and ate it alongside me. Awesome. Yeah, that was actually uh, quite hilarious. The good thing about that is it solidified for me at least that, okay, Kernsey was in pain because I could see Zach going through the motions and the burns as well. Yeah. So I was like, all right, cool. I wasn't sure if Kearns was just a good actor, yeah. you know, how, how it sort of went down. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's good to be back. Episode four, this is our second guest episode and we're going to get stuck into that real soon. Super excited for this one. Uh, but we thought we'd quickly just touch on, yeah, a couple of quick little things that have happened. Um, I, obviously, I was going to ask you about ProQuest, but you just wanted to brag about it instantly. Oh, mate, um, there was a so lot on the line there. It was a really cool event, right? I've never been to a fab event before and uh, shout out to the team at Lunar Cards that actually ran that event. Um, it was a really, really uh, interesting yeah. Like just in terms of, of watching how the fab game actually plays because I haven't done that before. Mm-hmm. Um, seemed like a really, really nice crew of, of, of guys and girls that were down there. Uh, and it was good to, to watch you just lose continuously. The, while I was there, you lost two games. So yeah. that was fun. Nah, it was a – yeah, shout out to, to Luna. It was a really good event. 38 players, really great venue and really close to like the finals were – Great games to watch. The watching the final game it ended up being like two or three life points between it. That was it. Yeah. That's so nuts. for a, for a full twelve hours of play, for it to come down to you know like a few hands, it was a really good event. Yeah. Now, nah, well done, mate. Four hundred and thirty eighth or whatever you said in the world uh, that you can you know you can only go up from here. 100%. You can't. You yeah, literally can't get any worse. <laughs> so I, w- I will get happy there. for you. Happy for you. Yeah. Um, I think our guest is about ready to join us, but just before that, we it'd be very remiss of us not to mention probably one of the largest card sales in modern history. Yep. A Alpha Black Lotus CGC Pristine Ten. Three million USD. That is insane. What's that in Oz? What's that like? Four point five. You'd say circa five mil. Yeah, five mil Australian for for a a black lotus. And we we just missed that news on the last episode because we filmed, and then a day later that sale happened. Hey, that's why we're here talking about it now, right? Yeah. This ain't a live podcast; it's recorded, so yeah, you know that's part of the that's part of the business. Um, but you know, in saying that, you're talking about a card that is 31 plus years old. It's obviously a big deal because the card, you know, those cards are meant to be played with. And a Black Lotus is super playable. That's why it's like its value is where it is. Mm. Um, not that, you know, I don't think you can use that in Magic at the moment anyway. It's like, you know, on their ban list or reserve list or whatever. I think you can only play with it in like their vintage style uh, gameplay things that they have. Um, but yeah, that was huge. It just shows that, you know, uh, no matter what's going on in the world at any one given time, there is always money in the hobby. Yeah, 100%. Between that and the... Those other some of those big you know basketball cards that we mentioned last week yeah you know those high end items they're they're always going to yeah, sell it's pretty crazy so uh, um, all right well I guess what we'll we'll do right before we jump into our guests as well remember guys in the description there is a link to Speakpipe that's where you can call us up and leave a voice message for the Hobby Heroes we highly uh, recommend and ask that you do because we really love talking to you guys and don't forget to go over to the Instagram the underscore Hobby underscore Pod uh, make sure you're following it for starters. Share it around. We're almost at a thousand followers, but more importantly, go there and vote for PSA or BGS because 
next episode, somebody is going to have to lose. Yeah, please go and vote. Make sure you go and vote. PSA for the win. (laughs) I'm going to lose again, aren't I? Probably. (laughs) Probably. But without further ado, let's bring in today's guest. Today's guest is a good friend of mine, uh, a, a, a shining light in the TCG community across across the country. Uh, some of you may know him, some of you you may not, but you, you definitely will after today. We are very pleased to have Chris from Cardio on today's podcast. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for joining us, my friend, all the way from Austin, Texas. Yeah, Dean, thanks for having me. All the way from where are you guys in Melbourne? Yes, yes, we are in uh, sunny Australia. Crushed. I, I picked one of the two Australian cities that I know, Melbourne or Sydney. It was a 50 50 coin flip. <laughs> you still need to, uh, you still need to come out here, my friend. I mean, I've joined you over there in, in beautiful Austin and you're yet to come and grace us here in Melbourne. What's, uh, when, when can we yeah. expect to see yeah, you I out think, here? I think, I think soon. I really want to come in the summertime. Summer 24. That's my goal. I so. mean, in, in your summer? Because I was going to say most of the time here is summer. Yeah, yeah. So June, July, when I say summer. Oh, so yeah. that's uh, in 2024. That's like now. <laughs> that's like in two months. Yeah. Oh, yeah, wow. It, it could I, be that I soon. Go out. We, we work with a, uh, a brand in New Zealand, yeah. and I really need to get out there to go see them, which we can talk about. And uh, I think while I'm there, I just need to – Pip down because you you guys are like New Zealand equals Canada, Australia equals US. That's that's the relationship, right? <laughs> Basically, something like that, something like that. Yeah. So, just for all uh, our viewers out there, this is Christopher Sheridan, the CEO of Cardio, or do you like to call it Cardio? Yeah, Cardio, the Cardio. heartbeat of your tabletop game. Yeah, yeah, Cardio, the heartbeat of your tabletop game. But every time we speak to folks in this industry, they say one of like five things. Is it Cardi, Cardio, Cardi.io, Cardio, or Cardio? Yeah, right. So any one of those five, and and I, I kind of know we're, we're being talked about. So. <laughs> that's the main thing, right? Yeah, that's it. Uh, well, I think uh, we've, we've got a long list of questions. There's a lot of things to know about you. You've had a really interesting journey, and we're looking forward to sort of touching on a lot of that. Um, but I think, you know, the, the best place to start is in the present right now. So if you could just run us through, uh, cardio, uh, your team and the mission at the moment, that'd be great. And then we'll be, we'll be happy to sort of take it back with a few questions and break down how you, you got to where you are. Yeah, let's do it. Cardio is a venture backed software company. We build software for the tabletop gaming industry. Primarily, we focus on building organized play and event management software that connects players, stores and event organizers, and tabletop publishers. We've been working on that for about two, two and a half years now. And the uh, first game that we launched with was uh, with Cryptic. And we had one game, three stores, and like 50 players. And now fast forward a couple years later, we're working with about 40 different games in about 2000 stores and we host tens of thousands of players a month. Yeah. So we've we've really enjoyed the journey from from them to now, uh, but we aspire over the next couple of years to to get even bigger. We want to hit 3500 stores by the end of 2024 and have uh, at least 100,000 monthly active players every month. That's our goal. So so currently is that uh active only say in the continent of north america or is that international as well no we have international events and and players so we've got folks playing in the philippines australia europe latin america really coast to coast i I think we're in maybe 30 countries right now if i'm remembering that correctly yeah i think about 30 countries um but what we really want to do is is develop into larger games and focus on the store. And so we've got a couple of products coming out here in the summertime, which is why I'm so excited to be here that are going to, we believe, enable stores to be able to run events in a, in a really efficient way. And so uh, we think that focus is going to push us over that that 
hump of of breaking the hundred thousand monthly active player barrier. Yeah, right. Interesting. That's uh that's very, very exciting. And like I said, you know, earlier on, I'm excited just to have you out here so we can we can host you out here and, and show you what Australia is all about. Um so I guess now we've got a rough idea of of where it is that cardio is. I think it's best to to take it back and, and get to know you a little bit better as a person. Uh, so the first thing I want to know is what was your first interaction within the hobby itself? You know, at what moment in your life did the the TCG or the trading card trading card hobby actually have an impact or hit you or influence you? Where, where was it? Was it in the schoolyard? Was it was it much later? Was it much earlier? Like, uh, tell us tell us that earliest interaction. Yeah, it's a really good question. In I think the earliest interaction for me was in the late mid to late 90s with pokemon my mom bought a base set booster box she bought the whole thing which unfortunately we opened and she used it as chore incentives so if (laughs) i would take out the trash and you know clean the front yard i'd get a pack kept my room clean every week get a pack so it was kind of the um like the chore wheel incentive thing and that was when i first started collecting pokemon cards and i was pretty big into pokemon for a couple years i stopped whenever the rocket set came out and then i went full regalia into Yu-Gi-Oh. that's the first the first time we sort of had that be you know uh how you sort of got in there like a very you could say your parents were uh influence or your or your mum in particular was the influence she was the one basically here's a carrot chris go take the trash out clean up and i'll give you some pokemon cards interestingly i didn't know what pokemon was until that point so it wasn't like i saw the show yeah and then asked for pokemon cards my mom just brought this box home and was like hey here's a new you know incentive for you yeah. to go do some chores and it was through that that i found the show and then started you know going kind of deep with it so it was technically uh debbie's fault we have debbie to blame so for, you for said the that next years. <laughs> well i mean you could say blame or thank right you know yeah it depends on the deck yeah it depends that's on it the deck. that's it so you you mentioned Yu-Gi-Oh there um does is that something that you did watch on tv then if you didn't watch pokemon like did you watch Yu-Gi-Oh? Or? yeah Yu-Gi-Oh was the first show that I can remember watching pretty religiously. It was like anytime that came on on Saturday mornings, I was watching Yu-Gi-Oh came on at like 8 30, 9 a.m. And the funny thing about Yu-Gi-Oh being a show that's based on a card game, when it became apparent that you could actually buy Yu-Gi-Oh cards, it was like, holy shit, this yeah. is what I got to do. Right. And so did you get, did I you get yourself the, the, uh, the dual disc, you know, the dual disc that, the, that you can no, I didn't get strap to your disc. arm and, and play didn't. that. Yeah, no, I, I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, that into the heart of the cards. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was, I was trying to be cool, you know, play it, play it a little, a little DL. But the, uh, thing I do remember is my first card was actually a Japanese card that I got from a gas station. So it was Japanese Yu-Gi-Oh. It was before the English launched in North America, and it was a Beast of Tal War Hollow card. Yeah, right. That's what I remember. Have you still got it? And then, yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. And then um, I remember going to my local card shop and getting the Yu-Gi starter deck and thinking I'm gonna kick my neighbor's butt because he's getting the Kaiba starter deck and Yu-Gi Yugi always waxes him. And that was such a imbalanced matchup that was like the the first step of the power swing between me and my neighbor i used to have it and then all of a sudden totally I was, shifted i was gonna say you you got the wrong deck in that in that yeah, instance yeah 100 everybody it knows the, the, the kyber Magician deck doesn't actually yeah yeah dark magician doesn't actually with the heart of the cards beat blue eyes white dragon you you just get white. <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah. exactly exactly so when did you so, when did you pick up the hobby again because i presume like a lot of us you probably didn't collect right through there was probably a period where you stopped and walked away and came back. Was there a period when you came back? Yeah, it was It was like early middle school, which in the U.S. is like sixth grade. You're 11 years old. That's when I stopped because I started focusing on girls and sports. <laughs> same and then same about story. 15, That's... It's, it's the, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the same. A tale as old as time in yeah. the hobby, mm-hmm. right? But uh, then at 15, I was in the chess club, mainly for the women, as you can imagine. <laughs> and... When people were done playing chess, they broke out 
Yu-Gi-Oh cards. And I thought, oh, man, I used to play Yu-Gi-Oh. And so I went and got my my deck that I had from like four years ago. And it turns out that cards got a lot better in between that period. So yeah. I just lost every game that I tried to play. And then that made me shelve it again because I thought this is ridiculous. <laughs> um, and then I didn't touch it for another like six or seven years until college. And then my buddies and I in college were at a Walmart and we saw Yu-Gi-Oh starter decks and I saw a starter deck for the type of cards that was used in uh, those matches against me in, in chess club, which was like the Dark World set. Do you guys remember that from Yu-Gi-Oh, yeah. the Dark World code? Mm -hmm. Is that like yeah. is that Toon World? So Pegas we... Pegasus Toon World? Is no, that... not Toon World, but I that's my favorite set though. Magic Ruler is my favorite card set of all time. Me too. Yeah. Agreed. Legitimately the best card set. And actually, um, I had a sealed box of Magic Ruler on display and had a bunch of people over to my home after running a, a tournament for a game called MetaZoo. And one of the players bet me that he could beat me in pool, and I scratched on the eight ball, and the loss was we had to crack the, the Magic <laughs> Ruler box. So we, we broke it that night. I had it sealed for years and then and then broke it. And I did not get the Blue Eyes Toon Dragon, which was a bit of a bummer. But yeah, that is a bummer. I digress. No, the Dark World was the, um, the set that came out I think in like, yeah, like 2007. And then they had a structure deck for it in 2011, 2012. And that's what I saw. And so I thought, oh, I'm going to buy this. And you guys should buy the other ones. And I just destroyed them because like that, that deck was so busted. <laughs> I can only uh, imagine. So that, was, that was like me getting my original neighbor back. I was finally able to. I can imagine yeah, in, uh, in college as well. It wasn't just like quietly sitting down, casually playing Yu-Gi-Oh. I, I just picture American college, all these red red cups you know like on american pie and stuff are they drinking all out of these red cups yeah i just so picture works. a room full of yeah you guys in red cups drinking you know whiskey or whatever and playing Yu Gi Oh. yeah what's what's really funny um and i'll i'll lie if you if you repeat this outside of this podcast <laughs> this is the only place i'll allow it to be said um we played a variant of Yu Gi Oh where you had to take a shot anytime you had to draw outside of your draw phase <laughs> nice. All right, I like it's that. An, it's an aggressive way to play Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah. At least it was ten years ago. Yeah, it also and changes so, the way you might, you know, play against your opponent as well. Just sure. like you your, know, if your, your monster cards end up being in the, the 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 trap and spell zone, and yeah, just totally shifts things. That, that sounds like like I've got the image of um yeah beer pong Yu-Gi-Oh and like cornhole yeah it's like a perfect night like, yeah. yeah that's just america to a t <laughs> yeah. american yeah. college yeah every every american pie movie those kids were playing Yu-Gi-Oh. you just couldn't see them through the party but they were there they were at a table um yeah so i, I did that in college and then after college i really didn't touch collecting until the pandemic and i think that's what started it for a lot of people again in their their young adult lives so that's where i came back to it was in the pandemic through an app called whatnot i was buying and selling pokemon cards just recreationally while i was working remotely through the pandemic and then i found whatnot through that and then i went down a deep and dangerous <laughs> rabbit hole and, uh, and and came out the other side uh committing my career to it with a with a startup company yeah, which we're excited to to delve a bit further deep into. I've heard you talk a lot now about Yu-Gi-Oh! and the play. And then obviously with cardio and your mission of getting into stores for playability, do you identify as a as a card player or a collector or both? Because I can obviously see that it's something you're really passionate about and you have been for a really long time. Where did, where, like can you draw are you drawing from those experiences when you were younger to now yeah that's a that's a really good question i i definitely identified as a collector when i came back to the hobby as a young adult and through my interaction as a collector i started playing the games and then i absolutely became a hybrid player collector and dean uh can attest to just how good i am at mm. playing card games yeah uh, you, it's a, still you still i still think you you cheated you still there's cheated. a space on your body that needs ink you cheated there's a contractual <laughs> agreement in place we yeah. yeah when i when i was in dallas we did play a couple of games of uh metazoo and um the loser had to get a tattoo i lost and you haven't got the tattoo yet well i mean look the yeah. reality was is i beat chris round one 
Uh, and then Chris obviously got a little bit nervous, disappeared to the toilet, then came back and then just wiped me round two and three. I was like, hmm, that's a bit sus. You know, what uh, What happened there? So we'll never know uh, unless we go again. But are, are, I will I will get the tattoo at some point. Are I you will. speculating yeah. that maybe there was some deck tampering while yeah, some he was foul in the bathroom? Play. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're talking Listen, about a guy uh, that obviously, you know, used to play beer pong and Yu-Gi-Oh in college together. So he's obviously a little bit crafty. <laughs> uh, and and yeah, that's and that's I'm making that accusation on this podcast right now. I reckon he uh, he, he 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 swindled me. I, I think that's uh, you know that's a lot of losers react by blaming other things <laughs> as opposed to themselves, and that's you know that's fine that you do that. Uh, uh, what I will say is Dean and I um, had to play with starter decks, so there's already a pretty big asterisk on mm-hmm. the amount of skill that was involved. Certainly some luck, but. I've never welched on a tattoo bet. I have tattoos as a result of bets, and I'm, I'm waiting for you to, you know. I promise you this, Chris. Up, yeah. I promise you this. When and if you come to Melbourne, you can take me to a tattoo shop, and it'll get done. Deal. All right. Absolute what? deal. Right on. You are um... cool. Well, yeah. So I, I, I did some, I did some, uh, some playing, and uh, yeah, I, I play a lot of games now. Pretty, um, I'd say regularly. I, I play Commander. And Magic, a ton. Everybody at the company plays trading card games. So when we're at lunch or, you know, doing uh, doing employee hangs after work, we'll play Commander. We'll play Lorcana. Guys here like to play the Star Wars Unlimited game. That oh, really how good's fun. that? Guys, That's really fun. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Guys Guys here play One Piece. Um, what's funny is we actually don't play any Yu-Gi-Oh. No Yu-Gi-Oh is played um, or, or Pokemon, but pretty much everything else. There's there's pretty regular gameplay. We do have some employees that play regularly in large Pokemon tournaments. Yeah, but I can't think of anybody that plays Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah, how's the? Uh, you just mentioned One Piece. How's how's the One Piece play scene over in the U.S.? Because I know here in Australia it is enormous. I mean, it's amazing. Like just just today we had on our One Piece Play Network uh, in San Marcos, Texas, of all places. I mean, a, not you know not a big town. A, a tournament with 20 people and the entry fee was like $65. I mean, $65 for a TCG tournament. It's wild. And uh, I've been to several events here in just the last six to 12 months that were based around one piece. There was a several hundred player regional that had maybe 500 people uh, a few months ago. It's a big, big scene. And we just saw the one piece tournament in California, I think had 2000 players. Was that the uh, like the that. nationals a little bit earlier in the year yeah. that they had? Yeah, yeah, the the Bondi Card Fest, yeah, which is incredible. It's nuts. So it's going yeah, nuts. one piece is, I think, one of the strongest uh, in terms of player communities. So, are you guys involved with them yet, or is that like a company that might might be on the radar, or or where does that sort of fit in with like the the cardio mission? Yeah, so we do not work with Bondi in an official capacity for any of their organized play stuff. However, the product that we have coming out for stores, which is something that we can talk about later on in the podcast, we're launching it literally next week. So the timing is great. That product will allow a store to create an event. It'll go to a branded application for that store that has a calendar of all their events, the ability for players to find events, buy tickets, register uh, and you can, as a store, create your event either on a cardio version of the One Piece Play Network or the Bondi TTG Plus system, where a lot of One Piece events are created. You can do either or, so it'll support both. So, Chris, I know that um, for you, this to, to, to go sort of full circle, there's been a bit of a, a career change or a career shift. So in, in aspects to that, I mean, to... To go all in and bring new business ideas to an industry and and sort of change the landscape, uh, was there any sort of one person or one moment that sort of had an influence on you to sort of jump out and take that risk? It's almost like I'm almost asking you, was there what was this the pinch me moment or the second when you said I need to cardio needs to exist? I think if there's one person that made me take the leap, then there are several. But if I had to name one, I'd probably say Dominic Pace, who's one of my co-founders of Cardio, and he is our chief technology officer. Dominic is a big technology guy and has a pretty successful career background working for some really exciting startups in the Austin area. Dominic was so certain of the market for digital transformation in tabletop gaming and TCG 
And we saw it everywhere on the collectability side during the pandemic, right? We saw a ton of VC money getting poured into applications like WhatNot. WhatNot is one of the most incredible VC stories. You talk about a company that comes out of one of the biggest socioeconomic uh, case studies of our history, right? The COVID-19 pandemic and everything that happened associated with it. And this business starts and within a year goes from zero to $6 billion in value. And they start competing against the likes of eBay who are 20 year Titans and, and only about four times as large. Um, that's crazy, right? And so seeing that on the collectability side, I thought, well, wow, that's really interesting. I didn't give it too much thought until we started a group called Caster Society. And the thesis of Caster Society was everybody's focused on collecting a game called MetaZoo. And eventually the collectability shoe is going to drop and the focus is going to need to be on gameplay. And so we're going to build a group on gameplay. And that worked. It worked really well. The focus in MetaZoo shifted very heavily to gameplay. And as a result, the audience that was focused on collectability started naturally shifting into gameplay and that came over to our audience and we grew really large and became the largest discord group for metazoo and it was that that kind of gave me this idea around well if that can happen in this little vacuum can it happen with digital transformation and all of the money and the focus on digital tools for collecting pivot into digital tools for gameplay when gameplay becomes the primary focus and so we said let's go be the leaders of that so when the market shifts towards uh, gameplay heavy market focus, we're going to be in a good spot. And, and that was kind of the initial thesis of cardio. And it's gone well thus far. And we're starting to see more and more an emphasis on gameplay as time goes on. And uh, I think we'll see that that trend continue. Now, that's not to say collectability is not going to be important. It's always going to be important, right? Like I think about um, Lorcana and one of the most exciting collectible moments coming up, which is the Lorcana challenge, right? Those big 2000 player tournaments, and they have unique promo cards that are driven by gameplay, but I think will be the most expensive Lorcana cards, period, even more expensive than the D23 cards, right? That's, that's so, a, a very good point that you make there. Yeah. Um, and I kind of just wanted to jump in because that's sort of where the crossover, uh, that that's like that's that's how you can really perfect a TCG is hitting that sweet spot crossover. I think we see you know a very stale sort of market at the moment for say something like Pokemon, but then when you look at One Piece, uh, a lot of it is driven. The day to day prices on singles are driven by play because people want to get to these regional and national events, win these promos or uncut sheets that people were winning at nationals selling for $25,000. Like you, there's insane collectability in, 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 the, in the prizing that you can win via the gameplay platform. It, it's basically the sweet spot. You're getting the best of both worlds and it sounds like, you know, Lorcan is doing the same. Whereas, you know, Pokemon in particular, uh, back in the day had those amazing championship promos and those metal cards. Incredible. The Pikachu some of, things some that we've of my seen. Favorite, some of my favorite cards are old school Pokemon trophy cards. Yeah. Some, some of, I think, the Pokemon cards are old school trophy cards. And actually, that's what I collect. So talking about collection, I collect cards that can only be obtained by playing in events. That, that's what I primarily collect across all different games. Lurkana, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh!, Digimon, uh, etc. Now, when you say that, um, do you collect them by winning? I, I highly doubt it because I've played you before and, you know, you're a <laughs> hack and a cheat. But um, uh, I, I'm going to assume that you're basically purchasing those and, and not winning those. That's hurtful, but you're right. Uh, <laughs> it's, entirely, it's entirely as a consumer, a secondary market consumer and not the primary market winner of said card. But yes, it. And that's where um, events like the Collecticons that, that happen here and Comic-Cons and different TCG conventions are, are really exciting for me because that's where I find the greatest concentration of those, you know, competitor cards. And one of the cool things about the nature of my work now is I get to go into stores all the time. I just spent a day in San Antonio visiting about 15 different game stores so that we can get them on our beta list mm -hmm. for this new product that we have coming out. And I bought three perfect, uh, pristine CGC 10 
Lorcana player promos, which are the promo cards that you get for going to play it at weekly locals. And uh, yeah, it's it's that kind of interaction going to stores where I get to go do some business and then in the same place uh, scratch a, a personal itch that's 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 really rewarding about working in the hobby. I really like to hear you talk about um, how whatnot disrupted the buy and sell and you identified that there was a gap in gameplay. I've been playing a lot of flesh and blood online at the moment. And for me personally, I don't get to play a lot in person. It's something that uh, just with my time of working two jobs, unfortunately, I can't get down and play as much in person. But by jumping online, I can find two games through the week really quite easily. And the importance of having that available there to stay in touch with other players and stay in touch with the game, I think is really important. So, um, and I also just wanted to preface, this is my first time meeting you, but this isn't my first memory of you because I'm really glad you brought up Caster Society before because I remember back a few years ago, there was a Caster Society MetaZoo Nation Uh-oh. live stream yeah. and you and your team, oh, that was dope. you and your team jumped on. It would, would have been probably midnight, midnight for you guys and you're up doing giveaways at 2, 3 a.m. in the morning for, yeah, for it was, us. It was, it was 3. Yeah, it was 3 a.m., I think, when we hopped on. And uh, that was awesome. I will say, Red Solo Cups were involved. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was pretty evident, I think. But you guys were really good sports. Yeah, yeah that was a fun time. That was really fun. It, it was, it was great. It was great uh, in Australia to have that connection point over to the U.S., uh, with the, the the live stream in the YouTube, the Discord and whatnot. So um, the the mission of Caster Society, is that also something that you're taking into cardio? Have you, Is there still that Caster Society team together? What does that look like at the moment? Yeah, so Caster Society is separate from cardio. Caster Society has indirect relationship, but the... Um, majority of caster society folks and and that wasn't a company that was more just a group but a majority of them came over to work full-time in what became a company which is cardio yeah and it's really really good because it means that the core foundation of the company we all know each other very very well and we can work well together because we've done it in a part-time hobby capacity Mm -hmm. so that was that was i think a, a blessing in terms of um where cardio kind of started yeah, it but, seems um, like it was a natural sort of progression. Like Caster Society was almost like a, a pilot to a degree uh, and a platform for you to sort of, you know, move forward and get to where you guys have gotten to now and, and sort of the trajectory that you're on. Yeah, it's it starts like a lot of businesses, right, where you start something kind of for fun and, and just to to just to do the thing. And then it works and then certain indicators or signals tell you that it'll work at a bigger scale and where it might be financially lucrative and personally rewarding, uh, from a, from a career perspective. And that certainly was the case as it related to, to cardio. And now we've got great investors, great employees, great customers, and great users. So we're, we're really thankful. I think everybody that started at Castor society that we made the decision to, to go all in on the hobby and, and really focus on transforming the gameplay side of things. Yeah. You you mentioned before uh, briefly about the convention circuit. Uh, obviously, it's it's very, uh, what's the right word, you know, extensive in the US in terms of Collecticon and Comic-Cons and, and all, these, all these other things. You've obviously attended quite a few over the journey as Cast Society and then a little bit later on as, as Cardio. Um, what I want to sort of know or, or want you to share is, is is any major mem- memorable experiences at, at those events, whether it be good or bad, uh, just to give a bit of an insight to you know to to the Australians that don't necessarily get to attend them. Well, one of my favorite is when you and the the lads came over for a Dallas event. That was super fun, and you came over to the states for what was that like a week? Yeah, a week, week, and a, at least, week, right? week and a half or something. I think. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was great. You stayed at the house. You we we went down to Dallas and played in the. Uh, MetaZoo Caster Cup, so that was a ton of fun. One of the really, really special memories that I have is closing our first contract as Cardio, which was at the Long Beach Collecticon. That was a really good memory, getting to call everybody and let them know, like, hey, we're doing this full-time, and that was really cool. Um, 
I think personally, my favorite memory, aside from you guys coming over and, and bringing me my Lake Worth monster, was <laughs> probably going to the Houston Collecticon in 2021. Yeah, 2021, which was before MetaZoo really took off. That was still right, right before Nightfall was launching, and it was this really unknown thing. I went with my brother-in-law, or I guess brother-in-law-ish, and and uh, we we hit a bunch of you know nerd shops, and then and then went to this Collecticon thing just kind of on a whim, and we we were just blown away by the lines and by the energy, and that was really what sucked me in. I think that's what galvanized me into whatnot was kind of that experience but it was fun i mean that was like a cool cool time and i don't think that that's necessarily over but i think tcg and, and the hobby is transforming more around a focus of what you described dean which is hype and excitement around the gameplay uh rewards and yeah. the unique stuff that can only be obtained that way because in 2021 during the pandemic we had supply issues there was a huge amount of demand. And so it was that inverted relationship of not a lot of supply and a ton of demand that made things really exciting. We've largely fixed the supply issues. Demand is tapered off, except for things like those organized play and, and tournament cards. And so that's the kind of stuff that really still gets me going as a result. Yeah, I think that was, um, you know, during COVID in, in 2020, there was that was obviously the point a lot of people came back into the hobby. You can honestly go back and say, you know, 2017, 18, 19, the landscape was nowhere near what it is today. And, you know, there was a few things that happened. Obviously, you know, a global pandemic that happens, you know, the second one since the Spanish flu in like the 1850s or whatever it was. You know, it's not a common thing to happen. But then you also, like when we spoke to to Gary King Pokemon uh, a couple episodes back, when you then use the power of social media and, and that sort of influence that's available now that hasn't been available previously and you get people like Logan Paul jumping on the bandwagon, that also brings more eyes to, to a hobby and has really re-sparked it and sort of set it back off again it particularly when you know when you think of pokemon it was huge through the the 90s and sort of the early noughties and then really tape it off and it was just the diehards that still had anything to kind of do with it and then it was that covid period that sort of shot it all back up so i, I see the the tcg industry and hobby as a whole being much larger and influential and longer standing moving forward because it's uh it's the same but it's different you know like like Cardio, yeah. for example, is not a company that would have existed previously because mm -hmm. online play via dial-up internet would have been absolutely horrific. Yeah, and, and I think about um, I think about why it's exciting when it tapers. You talked about like the 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 late noughties being a down market for Pokemon. It's not very exciting. Product from that period is the most exciting now, mm. and it's for a reason, right? Yeah. So it's cool to think about when you're in periods where maybe there's not a lot of hype or there's not a lot of excitement and you're just collecting because you really enjoy it. That's also a product that likely has the biggest upside yeah. moving forward. Right? Mm. And so that's something that's still exciting to me. And to your point, any industry that is going to be transformed with, with technology has to hit a certain threshold of technical adoption and, I don't think we'd hit that in this industry until the last three to five years. And that's as a direct result of what happened during the pandemic, which you're right, made it possible for a company like Cardio to exist. Makes a podcast like this viable as well, you know? <laughs> that's right. That's right. The hobby would have been uh, totally non-existent pre-COVID. So thank, <laughs> thankfully we've, 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 we've gone through this so that you guys have your, your, your moment in the spotlight. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, mate. I can see you itching at the bit. You've um, prefaced earlier that there's some really exciting things coming up for cardio. I think it's a really good time now to talk about that because that's what we're all really excited about. Um, I know you've already got a very extensive library of gameplay and, and stores on your network and expanding, but do you want to talk about some of the things that are coming up? Yeah, yeah. So the thing that we have coming up is uh, a product that we call Cardio Store. And it's our, our first product that's geared towards stores. But before I talk about that, I have to talk a little bit about kind of the market 
of organized play and what we saw before moving into it and why we're building what we're building. So largely, if you want to find a place to play a TCG, whether it's online or it's at a store or it's at a community meetup, there were two types of systems that you would use. You'd use something like uh, Bondi TCG Plus, for example. That's something that the publisher of the game would create. It's branded and immerses a consumer in the branding of that that TCG, and that's where you would find things. Or you would go to a application like Best Coast Pairings, for example, that has, hey, we create tournaments, and you can select all the different game systems. There's no branding, but you can find tournaments for all different types of things. And unfortunately, the hybrid of those two things over the last 15 years has created this ecosystem for stores where they have to go to six, seven different places to create events for all the different game systems and types of events that they want to create. And so when we started Cardio, we said our ultimate vision is to preserve the consumer immersion experience of organized play software where it's all branded for a specific game and they don't have to look at or think about anything else while providing the flexibility for the store to manage all the different game systems from one place. And so that's what Cardio Store does. It allows the store to create an event one time and have that event populate on the relevant play network and on their website without having to manage it in a bunch of different areas. It allows them to manage all their employees, all their event organizers in one place. So from our perspective, it's the first streamlined event platform for stores. And we think it's going to be a game changer. Mate, we're launching it. It's going to be huge. Yeah, we're launching it next week, uh, an alpha with a few stores. We're going to be working with Game Castle Sacramento, which is one of the largest stores in the country. Uh, and working with a couple smaller stores so that we can try to balance the experience between big store and small store and really deliver something that works for both. And then ultimately, we'll be scaling to about 20 different stores for a beta test throughout the rest of the month of May. And then we'll be launching it for general availability in June. And the best part is it's totally free for stores. I think it's going to be stores won't have to pay us a dollar. highly, highly, highly successful. Um, just from what I know, uh, working with a couple of different stores, um, just in terms of, you know, all these different weeknights and weekends, you've got all these different games. You have to go into different apps, different applications to create different events. So you've got to go into your One Piece one to do that. You've got to go into your Pokemon apps to do that. you then got to go onto your, your relevant Facebook page or social media and then go and post those separately and individually and then change it on your website and do this and that. So if what you're saying that you're creating is basically, you know, you go into this piece of software and go, all right, One Piece is going to be this, 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 bang, and then it's going to auto-pop populate to you know everything that you need it to that's that's time is yeah. money you know that's yeah. that's phenomenal yeah, we're, we're we're really pumped about it and uh if any stores that watch this podcast are interested in participating uh they can find me on linkedin or shoot us an email support at cardi.io we'd love for you to participate in the beta but i i think one thing i wanted to touch on while we're talking about kind of cardio and, and the products that we build is the the role of uh technology and, and we call it technology advancement and AI in this industry. A lot of people, when I tell them what we do, they think, oh, you're, you're trying to turn tabletop games digital, right? You're trying to convert the tabletop experience into a digital one, um, which is not at all what, what we think we're doing. We think that tabletop experiences can be better enjoyed if they're enabled with digital tools. And so a good example of this is our AI product, which we call uh, Cardi. So if you go to the playlorkanatcg.com application where we run several Lorcana events every day, we just had a really big Lorcana event today. It was like 275 people. It was run by a really good content creator named Tia Beastie, who's absolutely fabulous. Um, we have Cardi sitting on this website, and you can go and ask Cardi a question, any question about Lorcana gameplay, like you might ask a judge or like you might ask your friend, like, hey, I just played this uh, Grammatala card, and if I quest it, can I then play this card and have this thing happen? We're using AI and natural language processing to enable somebody to write that question. And wow. then AI will look at a rule book, it'll look at the card data, erratas, user forums, and then it'll respond with an answer. And so this is an example of technology not replacing the tabletop experience, right? Just trying to make it better. And so that's very much what Cardio is focused on doing. I'm gonna butt in there too, because um... 
a really another good point of that for people to consider. And, and I do this constantly. I use the one piece simulator that's been built. I use that throughout the week uh, or whenever I get time to practice decks, change different decks up before I go and buy all the cards and then practice those and, 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 and you know, get basically training. I use it like a training tool to then go and play the in-person events on, on other nights or on the weekends. They basically go hand in hand. I don't think, uh, I think looking at it as a, an attempt to replace is very naive because the reality is, is it, it's, it should be seen hand in hand whether, you know, like practice digitally or you can, you know, obviously, like you said, you can, there's still going to be big tournaments that you might not necessarily, especially, you know, in in North America and in Australia, it's the significant distance between major cities. So sometimes, you know, having the ability to play these tournaments online also means that everybody gets to be included. Well, and it's it's like Lee said earlier about, you know, oh, I, I maybe can't get to this store because I've got work and I've got life and I've got kids and everything else happening. But when I'm on the toilet, I could get a couple games in, or if I'm just sitting at my house late at night, I could hop online and, and find a couple games to play with. And that enables a enjoyment of the hobby. It's not taking away from it. I think that's really important for people to take away. A good example that I like to use when I talk to our uh, board about that dynamic is around movies and uh, short form content. So I will doom scroll on YouTube all the time and TikTok, Vine, Instagram stories and shorts, like all of these platforms have started going into shorter and shorter form content. It doesn't mean I don't like watching movies. I love Mm -hmm. watching movies. I love going to the movie theater, right? But it's not a replacement. And I think that that's really important for people to take away. Just because you enjoy a digital version of a tabletop game doesn't mean that you're not going to be really jazzed if you get to go play the tabletop game in person. And in fact, it'll probably make it even easier to do. One of the biggest barriers to all TCG gameplay is deck building and the fear of judgment around, am I going to just get wrecked? And then am I going to, you know, not have a good time and playing online, I think can help eliminate both of those. A hundred percent. Yeah. It happens. Like you play online, you get pumped, you go, Oh, well, restart next person and then you beat that person then you're like oh yeah pat on the back like you feel good you know uh i think it's it's a good it's a good point as well that um the the online sort of uh faction basically adds it adds more possibility for growth it brings more people into the hobby it means you get to share it more it gets to grow more we all get to enjoy it more yeah and one of the cool trends that we're seeing because we work with thousands of event organizers and stores is this idea of hybrid event organization where you have stores that have local in-person leagues and also have online events. And that's really cool. So we, we think that that's going to be a increasing trend moving forward where stores are going to host online tournaments as well as in-person tournaments and may even have some connection between the two, like a league based system, which is why some of the focus of the Cardi uh, cardio store product is going to be around local leagues and local mm-hmm. leaderboards and, and, giving a store the ability to seamlessly create a local ladder for their players to compete in in store and online chris i have this thing where i have sometimes i have these thoughts and i don't really know how i'm going to articulate it but it's like this is like it could go anywhere this is this is something that i just want to build on i don't know where it's going to go but we're just going to run with it yeah go with it we'll see if we keep it in (laughs) you were talking about accessibility and there's something that I haven't thought about before, which you just mentioned around being able to build a deck online and it's really d- difficult financial times for a lot of people out there. Some people don't have the accessibility money-wise to play these games. If you wanted to play, I'm going to go back to the game that I play a lot of, Flesh and Blood. If you want to have a competitive deck, you need to spend about a 1000 bucks. That's a lot of money Ooh. in person to, to play a TCG, right? Mm. Not everyone can is afford that. that, that which minimum? That's is that to minimum be, rarity to be like yeah. minimum rarity competitive deck thousand dollars a thousand bucks if you want to be if you want to be really serious and competitive you need to spend a thousand that's only if you want to be competitive if you want to just play flesh and blood you, you don't have to spend that much right? you don't have to spend that much but you're not going to have a competitive deck and you're going to get wiped on the floor yeah. and it's you want to have you want to have a go at a tournament a thousand dollars is your, your a thousand point. aud so about 600 usd yeah. Yeah, but, 60 bucks US. <laughs> 600. Is it real dollars or the, yeah. No. That's, I mean, that's a lot. Like, that's, Kangaroo that's jumping a lot. money. 
Um, yeah, that's that's a lot of that's a lot of money as a as a, a hobby. I mean, I you think about people talk you know, golf is expensive. My mm-hmm. golf bag does not have six hundred dollars in it. It's probably got you know no I mean? golf balls in it either because you would have lost them all. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, that's yeah. that's a different that's a different uh, podcast and a, and a totally different. Um, but yeah, the beautiful, totally different. Track. The beautiful thing about playing online is the decks free. You can trial out and play it, maybe play it for a few months and go. Actually, you know what? Now I am going to go buy this compared to maybe going and buying it or not being able to. Um, that accessibility is is massive from that standpoint as well. You think about the consumer funnel of convenience. You, you spoke about cardio is a one stop shop. It's not only gameplay and connecting with other like-minded people, but you're also learning as well through your AI. Like you literally are becoming connecting stores. Like it's phenomenal. Oh yeah, oh yeah. What you guys are building is is something really, really special. That's that's why it's yeah, here. Our, our, our vision, <laughs> our, our vision is to be the digital platform for the the tabletop gaming industry. So we want to be synonymous with tabletop gaming across every player every collector, every store and event organizer, and every publisher of tabletop products, TCGs, living card games. That's that's the vision. What's sort of, um, just for our viewers, what's say, you know, the I don't want you to like, you know, pick favorites, but the most recognizable sort of games at the moment that you guys are working with, Who who? what are those, which games? Well, I think one that jumps to mind immediately because of something we're about to launch with them is Sorcery TCG, which is close to you guys. They're they're up in New Zealand. Yep. It's a Kiwi game run by a really, really strong team across the board, a really strong team. And they're launching their reward store. They have this really unique system called Dust mm. that can be accumulated by going to events, winning events, and also opening and redeeming a code within booster boxes. Yep. And you can get unique promo cards, cool swag, T-shirts, hoodies, and even some really uh, rare products, which I can't uh, I can't disclose because it hasn't launched yet. But they're a really good example of a very successful tabletop brand that we're really proud to work with. We work with a lot of really great companies. Another one that comes to mind, which is a really well-run business, is a company called UVS Games. They run a game called universus trading card game they're about to launch a godzilla set that i'm really stoked about (laughs) as a godzilla guy and then they've got a set coming out for one of the most popular western animes uh, attack on titan which is going to be i think a really really popular product They, they just they're a good example from my perspective of a company that uses data really well in the tabletop gaming industry and that's because they come from esports uh video games and and private equity so they're just a really sharp outfit but we work also on the other side of the spectrum with a lot of really passionate indie TCG creators, and they're as rewarding from our perspective to work with because we get to be a critical part of something that is arguably one of, if not the most important um, hobbies in their life, right? And that's that's really cool for us to be able to, to be even a, a small part of that. So it, it's hard for me to pick uh, my favorite customer. I will say that there's a brand that we're talking to right now and in the, I think, hopefully final throngs of negotiation with that will be my favorite. Uh, and hopefully I can come on later at a, at a future date in the podcast and get to, and get to talk about that one. Well, I will, uh, I will sort of wrap that one up with, uh, do, is there any aspirational possibilities uh, like are you guys internally setting any goals to potentially be working with the likes of the Pokemon company? Like, is that on the radar? Is that sort of a goal to be breaking into, you know, that, that kind of level? Like, you know, you'd say that's like the, the top, like the pinnacle, you know, the Pokemon league. I mean, there's more games out there that have more money or more players, but you know, that is the Pokemon company. It's, it's a behemoth itself. Is that on your radar at all. Yeah, it would be absolutely foolish for a company to exist in a category that cardio exists in and to not have the ultimate aspiration to work with the Pokemon company. Um, of course, that is on our radar. And we think we would provide significant value to the Pokemon company even today. But one of the things that we feel really strongly about is if we focus on the stores and the players, publishers are going to want to work with us. And so our main focus this year is on store enablement. We want stores to use this cardio store product and think, how have I run events for the last 20 years? That, that's our goal, 
is to be just a really critical part of, of the store journey. And if we can do that really well, then the brands will come, so to speak. Yep. No, that's, uh, that's you know, a benefit of, of your previous experience and your business mind, I believe, because that is definitely the right way to do it. Well, now I can share this with our investors and our board and say, look, guys, as I've been saying, this is the right way to do it. We've got the hobbies seal of approval. <laughs> at least Dean, I haven't heard Lee comment, but at least Dean thinks this is the right path. I 100% believe it's the right path. <laughs> uh, perfect. Perfect. Uh, all right. Well, is there anything We're, else in, in particular that, that you feel like we, we should put out there in the airwaves before you've got, you know, your all your new products sort of coming and dropping? I mean, we'll obviously share your contact details in our description just to cover off uh, if any stores, you know, in, in Australia are, are quite keen to to discuss more about the opportunities that they provide. There's a couple of stores that I know that I will be showing this episode to in particular and go, you need to watch this and you need to reach out to Chris. Or I can put you in touch with Chris because this this is going to happen and you need to be a part of it. Um, yeah. Is there anything that we haven't covered that, that you would just like to make mention of? Yeah, I think one of the the things that we're really proud of is our, our commitment to uh, customer and user support. So we pride ourselves on same day support. It's in our SLA and our terms of service, and that's going to be an uncompromising discipline moving forward. So even as we grow and scale, we're adding to our customer service um, resources so that we can be really, really hands-on with, with guiding people around using our products and making sure that if they ever encounter an issue, that we're Johnny on the spot with a response and and hopefully a solution. So that that's something that's really near and dear to us. And anytime I talk to people about cardio, talking about customer support and and being a person to person business and not a, a person to answering machine business is really important to me. Yeah. No, brilliant. And I can uh, I can vouch for for all that for everybody that I know and the work that we've done together in the past and and the work we're going to do together in the future as well. So uh, beyond that, we like to wrap up our guest episodes with a couple of quick fire questions. These are going to be basically yes or no's or answer A or B. It's going to give us a little bit of an insight to to just you right before we uh, we boot you off and and we move on to to the next episode. Greener and, and bigger pastures. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. <laughs> this has been awesome. Um, all right, Chris, tea or coffee? Oh, uh, I have to say one of our investors created a very cool cold brew company, so I have to say coffee, and I think I believe it too. Coffee? I think, nice. I think it's coffee. One a day, two a day? Oh, more than that. More that, than that? that uh, remember that moon brew sort of coffee we went and got when we were in... in in Austin, so when when I when I went to Texas, I stayed with Chris for like three or four days or something, and um, the it other would have boys been hell for him. Oh, he loved it. <laughs> I slept on the couch. I slept on the couch. I was such a nice guy. I gave Did the other you? guy the bedroom, you and I slept have... on the couch. Look, there are multiple guest beds. Yeah, I slept on the couch. Um, huh. But we, we we he and I woke up early one day, jumped in his Mazda Miata, and just like roofed down, cruising down the highway, cool as. And he took me to this coffee place, and it was called like Moon Brew or Moon Coffee. It was really uh, summer, sweet, but summer, it was delicious. Summer Moon. Summer Moon. Yeah, summer yeah. Moon. They have this stuff called Moon Milk that I think is just straight sugar and cream. Yeah, I, I think it's that. It was delicious. It's though. good. You're gonna get me in trouble, Dean, because uh, Steve has a coffee shop in Austin and, and we didn't go. So Steve is one of our investors, great guy. Um, now I'm going to be in trouble. So I can't share this with him. <laughs> can't air the episode now. <laughs> he thinks it. I've never gone to Summer Moon. Yeah, now the biggest yeah. up. Um, which Dis Disney princess do you prefer, Belle or Jasmine? Belle. No, yeah. Jasmine from Aladdin is like the Disney princess. Nah, see, Belle all the way, Beauty and ja the Beast. Jasmine, Jasmine... <laughs> Jasmine came from a life of privilege. A lot of the Disney princesses came from a life of privilege. Belle picked herself up by her bootstraps. And uh, yeah, I love Belle. She's great. Love it. Intelligent, <sighs> resourceful. In Belle's the, awesome. In and the, a great card in Marcana, by the way. You guys have lost me now. In the trenches with me. Yeah. Love that, Chris. Dogs or cats? Yeah. Dogs. Fiction or nonfiction books? Oh, my favorite uh, book is called The Physician, which is a little bit of both. It's a fictional tale that draws stories from uh, actual history. So I call it like fictitious nonfiction. But that, it's a great, great book if, if you uh, are interested. Yeah, The Physician. That is such a politician sort of answer. <laughs> no, it's a really good book. It's like, okay, so it's about... <laughs> like you, pick, you didn't pick either side. Kid. 
No, it's about this kid who grows up and he becomes like the physician to the pharaoh. And traditionally, whenever the pharaoh dies, the physician has to die too. And he was like, mm, I'm not feeling that. So he <laughs> escapes and then goes through elements of of like that kind of Middle Eastern Mesopotamia, cradle of earth area history and spends time in Greece and a bunch of other cool spots. So it's it's a great book. Highly recommend, and it's yeah, it's a little bit of both. I guess that's that's fairly political. Fair enough. <laughs> I can't I can't upset anybody. You know, with <laughs> Do you prefer going out and eating or cooking in? Oh, going out and eating. Going out, yeah. What's the go-to? Uh, well, I'm doing the keto diet right now, so the go-to for me is this amazing shawarma food truck. Shawarma. It's called the shawarmas. Oh, oh, it's so good. It's so good. Uh, for a restaurant in Austin, we have a place called Red Ash that's absolutely phenomenal. It's like a Italian Chicago style pasta and steak joint. It's really good. Yeah. I wish I'd taken Dean out there. Dean, do you miss Whataburger? Uh, no. Fair. Fair <laughs> enough. We tried. We tried, to, we tried to get him hooked on it in Dallas. I remember <laughs> us going, and you weren't you weren't too impressed. No, I mean, I mean, I've been to In and Out Burger in LA, so you know it's it's hard to compete with that because that's pretty good. Ooh. Don't know if I'll be coming back on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't In and Out just like McDonald's? No, like it's no, nothing no, no. special, it's, right? No, no, it is. It's actually really good. Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. there goes our sponsorship with In and Out anyway. They had a they had a tournament <clears throat> like three or four years ago. It was during March Madness, which is our big college basketball tournament, and they picked the top like sixteen fast food burger joints from northeast, south, and west US. And the winner of the Western group was in and out. The winner of the Southern group was Whataburger. And then they played in the finals. And Dean, I'll have you know that Whataburger took the win. It's because there's more so. people in the South that probably voted. That's all. That, that's that's true. There are definitely a higher likelihood of people voting on a burger competition in Texas than there is in California. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly my that point. That's <laughs> I voted. I voted. I'm an example. That's good. Uh, unlimited trips to Disney World. Or Austin FC that, to win that, the title. That. No, 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 that. That. I that. don't even need to hear the second thing. Okay. Yeah, that. That one. Yeah. Love it. All right. This is the last one from me. All right. I need to set a little bit of context for this because I think this is a going to be a really difficult choice for you. So I want you to imagine the year is 2026. It's the World Cup. It's, we're at penalty shootouts. Oh. It's USA v France. Christian Pulisic has just put through the goal. They've gone up 5 4. And you walk into you walk into goals to save the winning goal, USA chance around the ground. USA have won. You've saved the penalty number five, but there's a small caveat. You never get to yeah. eat sushi ever again. Or the goal goes in, you lose the World Cup final, but you get unlimited sushi to eat for the rest of your life. A moment yeah. to be a hero or a lifetime of happiness. <laughs> Show us who you really are. Yeah. So here's what I do. Here's what I do. Um, in between the fourth and fifth penalty kick, I have a call with my agent. So I'm on the sideline. I've, I've, I've had the phone call and I said, look, I need you to call Eurasia in Austin, Texas. And you need to tell them that if I win the World Cup, I will do an ad, but my payment is that I get to eat there for free at any time. And I like to think that the type of agent I'd have would be able to hook that up. So he's... I'm going World Cup, and then I will try to finagle my way into <laughs> I knew it. I, he's, he's a politician at heart, this guy, I'm telling you. Um, President 2026, uh, that's what he's going to run it, for. It, it, it's a really cool. It's a really cool question that you asked, Lee, because I used to think about that not in the context of the U.S. winning – uh, the World Cup, but in the context of something that might have been more realistic, which is playing for Honduras. Um, that was a goal that I had in my early 20s. Um, I played professionally there, and my agent and I talked about what would be necessary for me to be able to get my citizenship and then play for their national team. And in my early 20s, I used to have dreams about playing for Honduras in the World Cup. So mm -hmm. it's cool that you asked me that question. Thank you. That was neat. 
Yeah, we thought we'd throw a little bit of you know your your football heritage in there. I was telling I, uh, I was telling Lee about it earlier. I was like, I don't know if he's actually any good. I know he just talks about how good he was. I don't know. I've never fact checked you, Chris, that actually looked Wait, up your as, stats. As badly as I waxed you in MetaZoo, is it? It'd be tenfold playing soccer, <laughs> or I, I'd venture to guess Aussie rules. I could take you in that as well. <laughs> mm, I'm I, confident. I can be easily convinced too. I just saw the photo of you goalkeeping, saving the ball. I was like, oh, he must be all right. He must be pretty good. Oh, I love that. <laughs> love that. All right, a couple more to finish it off then. Uh, I think I know the answer to this one based on earlier. Movies or TV shows? Uh, man, M- movies, if I can pay attention, TV shows if it's background noise. <laughs> he's like, he's picking, he's, he's got an answer for everyone. This is not how this works. What? You pick one no, or the other, that's, all right? That's movies. That's really fair. I think, movies or I TV think shows? Movies are. Movies or TV shows? No. I think movie then. Okay, good. A movie. All right, movie, good. Yeah. Texting or calling? Texting. Outdoor, no. outdoor. No, no, you said it. Texting. Outdoor activities or indoor activities? Outdoor. Outdoor activities for sure. Watching sports or playing sports? Playing sports. Doing, doing over watching in any category. Okay, cool, cool. Marvel or DC? And, can and I expand this, on this one? Without, and this, you, can I expand on this one without getting in trouble? You can expand, but you have to only pick one because I want the one that you don't pick. I want their fans to hate on you, so you can only okay. select so, one. Fantastic. So one of our investors, we're very lucky to work with a gentleman who is the executive producer of Marvel Studios. Whenever. Avengers launched. So he started his career as an associate producer on Iron Man, worked his way up to head producer for Iron Man 3, and then was the guy for Avengers and stayed, I think, through Guardians 2. And when you hear him talk about all the people he worked with, James Gunn really jumps off the page of like, this guy does really cool shit. And so I'm really excited to see what DC looks like with James Gunn at the helm. Right now I'm a Marvel guy. All of the movies are just better than DC, but I think DC powered by James Gunn could be really sick. I mean, really, really cool. So that's that's my pander to both. But if so I had DC, to pick one up, DC, up. which is good because I'm a Batman guy. So I'm DC naturally. You know, it just kind of happens. What do you think about uh, the new Joker movie with Lady Gaga as Harley Quinn? Do you think that's going to be any good? Well, I think Lady Gaga is a very, 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 very good actor. Uh, I really Amazing. enjoyed. I really enjoyed her in the House of Gucci and in um, God. What was that sad one? Born with Bradley Cooper. Yeah, with Bradley Cooper. What was that? Born yeah. to be a star. Yeah, she. I think. Yeah. I think. I think she's a phenomenal singer, but I think she's a really good actress. Like really, yeah. really good. Uh, and it's then, funny. I was just having this conversation with one of my colleagues. We were driving through San Antonio talking to stores, and we talked about this. And he said, "I think they just did that so they could use her her music for less of a royalty." <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's, that's a fair uh, yeah, shout. Maybe at the beginning, but not after the movie came out. She was amazing. Yeah, yeah. No. So, all right. And to round out the quick fire, PSA or BGS? I I can't comment on that. You have to. No, I can't. I can't. There's that commercial interest. Oh, All really? Companies are great. All so, grading companies are great. <laughs> Absolute cop out. I wonder when I was going to catch him out, and I think I think <laughs> we finally did it on the last one because Lee and I uh, on on our last episode we we have a segment called the Hobby Rumble, and uh, that we basically have a debate, and then our viewers vote. And whoever loses cops a punishment. So I had to preach why PSA is better or or preferred, not better, just preferred. And and Lee obviously was was BGS. So we did that previously. I had Pikachu, he had Charizard. Pikachu won by landslide. I've got PSA now. Uh, current voting, I think I'm still in front. Um, it's not but yeah, about it. thanks, thanks, but no thanks for your help there on that one, Chris. Well, if it's if it's which one is more preferred, PSA obviously is more preferred. It's just a what, what were the the results that came out for that April um, report? There was a report that was released for April twenty twenty four of submissions. It was like PSA had I don't know maybe twenty times as much as Beckett. Yeah, mm. yeah. Like one point two million slabs versus sixty thousand. Yeah, it's just you know, it's just it, it it's it's a behemoth. It's it's sort of the first thing you think of. You know, we don't need to go yeah. back down that road. I've already I've already preached all that and everything. But uh, 
that was uh, that was that was awesome, Chris. We really, really appreciate your time, and I, I can I must stress to the viewers, it is very hard to get some of Chris's time. He is a busy man, very successful, doing a lot of great things, and we we really do appreciate you giving us some time today to to run through uh, who who you are, what it is you do, and cardio in particular, because there's a, there's something I think uh, it's a brand and a business and a company that anybody involved in the TCG space will will be talking about for quite some time. Well, thanks for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. I love talking about this stuff, and, and I hope that we can do it again as uh, we, we knock down some more of our milestones for this year. I'd love to share that big one that we're working with because, man, I'm excited. Yeah, so. no, we're excited too. We're all going to be watching, and no doubt when uh, when that announcement is made, we'll definitely be covering that just on our on our news episode for sure as well. So thanks again, my friend. I am really looking forward to having you hopefully here in the next couple of months. Yeah, cheers, lad. Thanks, mate. Take it easy. Wow, another good chat. Another another really really good chat. I mean, Chris is a great bloke. A great bloke from across the pond. One of my one of my favorite Americans. Don't take that to heart, any of you. You know, there's there's a lot of you out there. But uh, I spent a lot of time with Chris and know him know him personally, and and he's a very very good businessman. And and it was really nice to have a bit of an insight into him, but also a lot of insight into uh, into him. Him, himself and cardio or cardio. What are we going to call it? We're going to call it cardio. Ca- cardio, yeah. We're going to go cardio. Yeah. Not like the exercise, no. like the company. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I think it's going to be that one-stop shop sort of uh, idea system in terms of all these different games that have all their different uh, landing pages for their own uh, play networks. It just makes sense. Like as a store owner, less is more, right? The more you can get from less time – the more value you can add to your customer experiences and all those sorts of things. Of course. So if you just got to sit there and update one sort of piece of software that is then going to populate everything to these other ones, that's just, it's time is money, right? It's, it's more time that you can put back into that business to ensure the other experiences for your customers is where it needs to be. Yeah, it's definitely going to shake the meta. It's going to, it's going to be, you know, what, whatever. I can see us using that in the future. Oh, 100%. It, it'll 100%, be there. Yeah. I, I thought it was really good as well. I always enjoy hearing of people's, like, where they come from as well. Yeah. So similar to you, he was massive into Yu-Gi-Oh! when he was younger and his mum used to bribe him with Pokemon packs to do chores. How interesting was that? Yeah. He's like, he's like, I'd never heard of Pokemon before. My mum bought a base set booster box, yep. which back then was just a booster box of Pokemon cards yep. and used to bribe him with, you know, base set booster packs. So you go clean your room or take the trash out and, and you'll get a pack of cards. Like, yep. oh, well, I wish, why, can't, why can't my wife do that to me now? <laughs> like, <laughs> I'll take one of those and be like, yeah, I'll do anything. <laughs> I'll do the dishes and your dishes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do that anyway. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> but yeah, and um, you know, I, I love. Uh, we seem to keep mentioning Disney Lorcana, and you know how heavily that gameplay over there is at the moment. Yeah. It's um, it's great to hear um, just some of the exciting things that's coming out of that as well. I'm excited about Lorcana. Yeah, I, like I said, I think I've said it every episode as well. You know, yeah. I'm sort of. Uh, I think when it finally hits the Australian shores in a full capacity as opposed to just an import capacity, yeah. uh, I think that's when we'll start to see it really, really grow. I mean, it's Disney, man. Yeah. It's Disney. It's massive. Um, so, And yeah. then he dropped the bomb on us with maybe being here in a few months. Yeah. So that's exciting too. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be awesome. If, uh, if he's here and just happens to be when we're recording an episode, maybe he'll pop in. Popping in the studio. That would be awesome. Yeah, have a, have a quick little in-person chat and sort of maybe get an update on a few of the things he mentioned and just sort of see, see you know, how he's going with all those and, and where they're going with that. That would be unreal. Yeah. So, all right, well, that brings us to the end of another episode. I will make mention, uh, again, in the description, you'll find the SpeakPipe link. So for Hobby Heroes, call us up, leave us a question, a you know a message you know whatever just call up and say good day we we just want to talk to you guys we really enjoy that part obviously the hobby rumble psa versus bgs go over to the instagram the underscore hobby underscore pod and go to that uh post and vote on there um and then hopefully you know we can see colonel be punished again it's not looking great it's not looking great, it's not is it? It's looking great. It's not <laughs> looking great. All right. Well, that's it for us. Wheels up and we are out of here. We will see you next time. Yeah.